I'm just going to run through some little experiments that I've done over the years in sort of vegetable crops. So the first trial was a field trial we did on ginger in the Andina, which is about 100 k's north of Brisbane. And the main uh, pathogens of ginger are root knot nematodes, fusarium and pythium. So what we did was we set up a trial where we had a, some cover cropping treatments and we also had a pangola grass pasture as a treatment and we also had a bare fallow. Uh, the tillage, we had till and no-till and we also had a treatment where we put a lot of organic matter on right at the start which was a mixture of poultry manure and sawdust. Every year we collected soil from those plots and put it into a bioassay in the glasshouse. So we actually, what we did was we grew a tomato plant in the soil and we inoculated the tomato with 10,000. So we're looking at suppression of nematodes. So root knot nematode is the nematode problem. So we actually uh, inoculated those plants with 10,000 nematodes, grew them for eight weeks and measured the population of nematodes at the end of eight weeks. So, so in the bare fallow, we finished up with 459,000 nematodes on, the, on those roots after eight weeks. So we put on, so the nematode population has multiplied from 10,000 to 490,000. So it's been a, a 45 fold increase in eight weeks. There's always less nematodes in the no-till situation than in the till situation in both years. Uh, this is the amendment present. The numbers are generally lower, but again, they are less in the no-till than the till. And then in the pasture, we had a, a no-till in the pasture, but there was actually, where the amendment and the pasture, the numbers were quite low too. So I guess the, if we had grown a cover crop or a pasture, we had more suppression of the nematode. There was something in that soil that was keeping the numbers down and stopping the nematode from multiplying. The amendment itself made a, made a, made a difference and also tillage made a difference. So where we, the numbers were always lower in the no-till than they were in the till. We had a fumigation treatment in this trial and certainly when you fumigated, if fusarium got back into that, it would take off and become worse. But really the organic amendment had no impact on the fusarium. And the pythium, there was some impact. Um, the tilled fallow soil, uh, we got quite a lot of dam uh, plants with uh, rhizome rot, which is the uh, you know, problem we get when we, you have pythium. Uh, but when we had the crop and the organic amendment, we got less plants with rhizome rot, so there was a benefit. But, it, but they weren't good enough to suppress the pythium in a really bad situation. So uh, pythium is worse in a really wet, hot soil. And if you had a, a really wet weather at that time of the year, then it, you could do this and it's not going to control the disease. But in a, perhaps a less aggressive situation, you know, it, it might have worked. So what I guess the story from that is that you know, we're certainly getting suppression of nematodes, but we're getting uh, less suppression of these pathogens. And that's one of the problems with this biological suppression issue is that you've generally got more than one pathogen to deal with and the biology might, might suppress one of them, but not necessarily everything. This is an experiment I did on capsicums in Bundaberg. Uh, so there they have the typical plasticulture system where they have, have very little biological activity. So what we, tried, what we did there was we compared what we called the conventional system with what we hope was a more sustainable system. So in the sustainable system we actually added, this experiment went for two years, so in the first, first and second year we added a compost amendment in the conventional system we grew forage sorghum as a rotation crop for about 11 weeks and that's basically all that you know, we did. And then in the sustainable system we actually, in the first year we used rose grass as the rotation crop, in the second year we actually grew forage sorghum for about two months and then we planted soybean following that. And so we've used a variety of soybean that's resistant to root, not nematodes, so we wanted the nitrogen effects from the from the legume without getting, building up nematodes. So forage sorghum is resistant to root, not nematodes, so it's not going to increase the numbers. And uh, there was no tillage in that, that treatment at all. Uh, and we actually laid plastic over you know, the organic matter in this case, so we were comparing a plastic system with a plastic system at the end. But I guess the important thing we found was that in the first year, we, uh, there was no difference between the two systems. The nematode problems were just as bad in, in a conventional system as in a sustainable system. But in the second year, uh, they were the roots of the capsicums 
uh, in the conventional system. You can see those uh, root nematodes are completely dominating that, that enormous numbers of nematodes in that system. So we got better yields in, the, in, in what we call our sustainable system. The root gall index, which is a range of from those one to, or zero to five, so we've got a lot less um, galling and a lot lower nematode population in our sustainable system. And what we also did was, just when we planted the capsule, we actually inoculated some nematodes into the soil at the time we planted. In the sustainable system, you know, they didn't, we didn't get much more nematode damage even when we inoculated with nematodes. So there must have been something in the soil that was keeping those nematodes under control. So again, there's an example where by changing the way we grew it, we certainly were creating an environment where the nematode didn't do as well. I'll just here uh, put a couple of examples of Queensland growers who are sort of using what I think are more fairly sustainable systems. This is a guy in Bowen who's a tomato grower using a system where he used uh, Centrosema as his sort of rotation crop. Then he would uh, roll it and spray it out with herbicide. And then he'd use a trash planter to plant, uh, to cut through the trash and sow his tomatoes, or his, sorry, his cover crop. Um, and then uh, he'd plant his tomatoes into that mulch. And some of the measurements that were taken on his soil, and he'd been doing this for about five years when we, we did, got this data, and certainly he had a lot lower bulk density, so the soil is a lot lighter in terms of um, you know, mass to volume in that permanent bed system than his typical cultivation plastic system over here. A lot more earthworm activity, a lot of earthworms here, that's earthworms per litre of soil compared with virtually none, no worms under the plastic. Then we measured a whole lot of different things in the soil. So was, that bacteria is one of the bacteria that you know, does produce antibiotics that controls some other pathogens. Uh, there were more fungi in the soil. This is a method of microbial activity where you're measuring the amount of degradation of a, a, a fluorescent dye that you put in the soil. And it's a, a lot higher in the uh, permanent bed system, about twice as, two or three times as high. And these free-living nematodes, the bacterial and fungal feeding nematodes, were also double the number in that system. That so there was again evidence that he's changed the biology in some some way with that system. You know, it takes time to develop those systems. It's not something you do overnight. And I guess that uh, we've talked about it all. And you guys have got different types of soils to some other people. So you really got to develop a system that depend, you know, is appropriate for your soil type environment and principal crop and it's not going to be the same for everyone but I think the key components are to have plenty of biomass production, uh, permanent ground cover and minimum tillage and uh, I guess the problem you have in potatoes is there's always got to be some tillage and so you, but try and keep it to a minimum is what I would say. I think uh, one thing that's important with nutri everyone has to fertilise, but there's certainly, uh, it, particularly if you whack on high rates of anything at any one time, will have a detrimental effect on some of the organisms. So uh, I showed you some of those nematodes that eat other nematodes. They are very susceptible to high nitrogen. Uh, if you put a large dose on at one, you're going you're to have negative effects on a whole range of different organisms. So I would sort of say, always say, a little and often is better than that. So, but it's the, the other reason, high nitrogen inputs tend to give you a bacterially dominated soil food web. So a lot of agricultural soils are bacterially dominated. So we've lost a lot of fun, fungi from the system. And you know, we, high, high phosphorus levels can be detrimental to um, mycorrhizal fungi, for example. So uh, pesticides, there's a really good review article by a guy at the University of Sydney it sort of summarises a lot of the effects of agricultural pesticides on the biology. Um, but basically, if you look through the literature, you know, pretty well everything we use has some effect. The problem, though, when you read a lot of these articles is they're often done with sort of extreme uh, doses of the thing and not the sort of uh, doses that are used in the real world. But certainly, it's, I, I guess what I feel is people, you need to think about where they really need to use these pesticides and, and, and have a think about what the off-target off effects might be. 
Yeah, some of these larger organisms have very long life cycles and they don't come back quickly and if you kill them, they, you know, they take a long time to come back. So, so those big predatory nematodes, for example, are very, very susceptible to nitrogen inputs and they have a life cycle of four or five months. So you kill them, you know, they're going to take six, you know, six months to come back. So they will come back, but they're not going to come back as quickly as some of the other things. And it's really those higher order things that are quite important. They are a lot of the predators and parasites and things. Um, biological products always come up, you know, are they worth using? I guess I'm, I believe that you can, you know, that we've got these organisms in the soil and if you manage it correctly you can sort of get them, they're already there. Even though some of our soils aren't in great shape, there's still a lot of competition there and so uh, any introduced organism has to face that sort of competition. So, and the other thing is if, you're, if your soil is not in a shape where that organism can do well, then putting another, the same organism is going to just drop away for the same reason if the environment's not suitable. There's all these sorts of things that are promoted, organic products, and at least you're adding some, a food source for an organism there, so, but at, at such a, a very low rate that I'd be very sceptical again that they're actually effective. Um, and so I guess my sort of suggestion is uh, if, you, if you're told that these things are good, don't believe everything you read on the internet. You'll see all sorts of things on the internet that, about how great these things are. Be sceptical of people who may, may claim they're effective. Have a look in the peer-reviewed literature and see where there's any evidence, and you generally won't find any. Uh, see if you can find some trial data from someone independent of the people who are selling it. And uh, ask them for a product and, and do a trial for yourself and ask them to give it to you. Um, so yeah, I believe you have to set up trials and you, know, you can do them all sorts of different ways, but you know, uh, might, you know, you, whatever you're trialling, you know, it's a red, red for the trial and then white for untreated and set out some plots and convince yourself that it's really having an impact.